Assalamu alaikum. How's everyone? Good? Not that good? A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Was salatu was salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Um, it's an honor to be back here in your beautiful city. MashaAllah, uh, it was a beautiful montage that you made. Uh, I appreciate coming to the city. It's, uh, I think, alhamdulillah, for the last few years, I've had the opportunity to come and visit your city. It's, um, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's relaxing. It's, it's different than KL. Um, and alhamdulillah, I love, I love to, to come here and to visit your community. Uh, I, I want to begin the way that I have been beginning all of my classes, and that's by asking everyone here to take an active part in your own learning. So what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, in order for you to attain something, in order for you to get to a destination, you need to be very clear on what the destination is. And so what I want to ask everyone to do is to, within your own heart, just set an intention of what you came to receive, what you want or need in your life and what you hope to, hope to take home with you. Set a goal and set an intention. Everyone understand? The second part of my request is that I want to ask you to make a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you that which you came to see. And for Allah to give everyone who came here what they came to see. And for Allah to put barakah, blessing, in our time together. Can you guys take a few moments and do that, please? Raise your hand if you, or give me a thumbs up if you're good on both requests, if you've done it. Does there, some other people need more time? You're good? Okay. Um, is there anyone who cares to share anything about what they hope to gain or take home with them? You don't have to, but don't be shy. If it's personal, that's fine. Does anyone want to share? Yes, sister. Um, up in the front. She's up in the front. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Alaikum salam. Uh, I would like to understand truly the meaning of istiqama. Okay. So she wants to understand the true meaning of istiqama. All right. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do that. Anyone else? Okay, okay, bismillah. So I'm going to begin by talking about the concept of istiqama, and then I want to move into the practical aspects of how can we have istiqama. First of all, what is istiqama? Istiqama, yastaqim, istaqim, it means to stay firm. So istiqama is, for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, He doesn't just tell us to pray. He says, Iqam is salah or Aqimu as salah. What does that mean? He's telling us to be firm in salah or to establish the salah firmly. So, istiqama is to establish something firmly or to be solid in something, to be firm in it. Another example to give you sort of an illustration from the physical world of istiqama is if you look at a solid tree. A solid tree has istiqama because it stands firm and solid even when the wind blows. Even if a storm hits, it stays firm. 
Now, the question is, how can we be like that, right? And that's the question. The sister was saying she wants to learn how, or she wants to learn what is that, and how do we seek that? So how do we have the ability to have what, you know, there's different terms for it in English. Resilience is one of the words. Grit. Some people use the word grit. So it's the ability to stand firm. It's the ability to be consistent. Now, of course, in the context of our deen, it's talking about being firm in our, in our iman, being firm in our worship, being consistent and solid in our worship and our, our belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us there's two parts. Alladina amanu wa anyone? Amilu salihat. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about iman, he couples it with amal, right? He couples it with action. So we know that there's two parts of what we're supposed to be doing. There's the inner part, and then there's the outer part. What's the inner part? The belief, the iman. Another way that this is referred to is the ibadah of the heart. There's a ibadah for the heart. There's a worship for the heart. There's also a ibadah for the limbs, for the body, for the tongue. There's a worship for the ears, for the eyes. So there are, these, there are the internal ibadat, the internal part, and then there's the external part. The internal part has to do with our belief, our iman, how we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how we view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how we respond internally with the things that we face in life. That's internal. Our certainty or doubt, right? Certainty is yaqeen. Doubt is shak. So these are all things that are internal. And then there's the external part, which is our worship externally, prayer, reading Quran, guarding our ears, guarding our eyes. All of that is the external type of ibadah. Now, in order for us to have istiqama, we have to have istiqama internally and we have to have istiqama externally. And they're connected to each other. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna fil jasadi mudra. Indeed, in the body there's a there's a lump of flesh. Ida salahat salahal jasadu kullu. If it's set right, then the entire body will be set right. Wa ida fasadat fasadal jasadu kullu. That and if it is corrupted, then the entire body will be corrupted. Ala wa hi al qalb. Indeed, it's the heart. So what are we learning from this hadith? We're learning that the master of the body isn't actually the mind. That sounds a little strange because many people try to say, no, my mind is in control over my heart, right? You hear this a lot. My mind controls my heart. Well, I have, a, I guess, a news flash for you. It's actually your heart that controls your mind. What do I mean by that? The type of heart that you have will control your thoughts, your mind, your actions. The type of heart you have. And so the mind actually becomes a slave to the heart. That's interesting. That you will think of ways, you will become, the, the mind becomes a slave to whatever the heart is. So for example, if the heart is corrupted, the mind will think of ways to do corrupt things. And that's because the heart is corrupted. The mind becomes a tool and a slave to whatever's in the heart. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that if you take care of that lump of flesh, which is the heart, the qalb, Everyone clear that when I say the heart, I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about the spiritual heart, the qalb, the qalb. So if that heart is purified, then the rest of the body will be purified. See, إِذَا صَلُحَتْ If it is set right, then the entire body will be set right. 
What does it mean when the Prophet ﷺ says the entire body will be set right? It means our actions will be set right. When you, when you purify the heart, when you take care of the heart, when you feed the heart, when you rectify the heart, then your actions follow. And when the heart is corrupted, when the heart is starved, when the heart is not taken care of, when the heart is deprived of oxygen, then the rest of the actions will also be corrupted. Aisha radiallahu said in a sahih hadith that if the first verses to be revealed were do not drink alcohol or do not commit fornication, haram relationship, the people would have said, we will never give up alcohol and we will never give up fornication or haram relationship. But the first verses to be revealed were not about the rules of haram and halal in that way. They were not about do not drink alcohol and do not commit fornication. The first verses to be revealed, if you study the Qur'an and you look at the verses that were revealed in the beginning of the, of the mission of Muhammad wasallam and you compare it to the verses that were revealed in the second half, they're, they're generally different. The Meccan ayahs, the ayahs that were revealed in Mecca are different than the ayahs that were revealed in Medina, in theme. The theme is, is generally very different. What is the theme of the ayats that are revealed in Mecca? It's all about building that taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala building an attachment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the day of judgment, learning that we will be asked, that we're not just living in this life without a purpose, that there is a purpose about Allah's oneness, about the day of judgment, about retribution, about life after death, about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and so that we can love and fear Him. That those ayat were building a foundation. This is the foundation of istiqamah. There has to be, see, if you go back to that solid tree, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ibrahim, when he gives an example of a good word is like a good tree. How does he describe this, this good tree? Asluha thabit wa far'uha sama. Its foundation is solid. Thabit, it's solid. And then, its branches goes towards the sky. See, you can become, you can become elevated. You can go, you can grow, you can get higher, but only if you have solid roots. Does that make sense? The, the, the taller a tree gets, the deeper its roots have to go. If you study the way Allah has designed a tree, you'll find that the, the, the taller it is, the more deeply and more wide the roots have to be in the ground. And the more solid the foundation has to be. Even mountains have foundation. And the taller it is, the more it has to have that foundation. Everything in order to be solid and, have, and to be firm and to have istiqamah has to have a solid foundation. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us even in the training that he gives us and the training he gave the companions. It didn't start out with rules. It started out with building our foundation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what, is, what happens now? Once you have a foundation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know that you will be asked. You have love and fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you have taqwa. You build your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when Allah tests you, or Allah make, gives a commandment, then you can have istikhama. Why? Because you have a solid foundation. Go back to the example of the tree. When the wind blows, if the tree is solid, what happens to the tree? Well, it's leaves, you, you, you know, the leaves might move, the branches might move, but the tree stays standing, right? It's solid. 
But what happens to a tree that doesn't have deep roots? Well, the wind can knock it over. Let me tell you what happens to human beings. When a human being is raised in such a way that they don't have solid roots, with Allah, I give you guys an example. There's a certain method of raising people in Islam. And that method is what we might refer to as the rule shaming method. The rule oriented slash shaming method. Let me explain what I mean. This is the method where you, as a, as a kid growing up, the only thing you really learn about is haram and hellfire. And, you know, you go to school, you come home, the only words that, that these children might learn is haram, haram, haram. This is haram, this is haram, this is haram, that's haram. <laughs> Your existence is haram. <laughs> um, and, then, and then it's like, if you do haram, you will go to hellfire. Right? Children are being taught that. That's what children are being taught. That's how they're being taught. Why are children being taught that? Well, it is true there are things that are haram. And it is true that hellfire is real. And it is true that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has anger and wrath. This is all true. But why are they being taught that above his mercy? Why are we not teaching our children that Allah is the most merciful? And that even if you make a mistake, you can repent and you can try again. Why is this not the message that we're being taught? And the answer, unfortunately, sometimes is because this is to control the behavior of the child. And the idea, the wrong idea, is that you use fear to control, but it backfires. Do you know how it backfires? I'll tell you how it backfires. When you're using false fear or false shame, unhealthy shame to, um, to control someone's behavior. You're not building solid roots. You're just building avoidance. Let me give you an example. Um, imagine that you grow up in a household where you're always being told to, you better watch out or the police is going to put you in jail. You better not make a mistake. You better not do this. You better, basically you're, you're taught to be afraid of the police. Why? Because the police is made out to be this very wrathful, scary entity. Okay. And every single day you're told, and as you grow and as you grow, you're, you're being told, watch yourself. You see those police? They're, got, they're out to get you. They're going to get you. See that jail over there? They're going to throw you in there. You better not make a mistake. Fine, you might avoid the police, but are you going to want to be close to the police? Are you going to want to be best friends with the police? Are you going to confide your problems to the police? Are you going to ask the police for help when you're in trouble? And the answer is no, because you don't trust the police and you've been told that the police is just going to punish you. You guys understanding what I'm saying? So what's happening is this method is not building istiqama in, in, our, in our youth and in, our, in ourselves. It's building avoidance. So many people raised like this, they grow up and they don't want to have anything to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They actually want to avoid Allah and religion. Why? Because they say, you know what? Everything is, everything is haram. And no matter what I do, I'm going to go to hell anyway. Weird things like that, they think. Everything I do is wrong, so what's the point in trying? Oh, you know, I, if I make any small mistake, Allah is going to punish me, so I should just avoid this whole Allah thing. I should just avoid this whole religion thing. You see, what's happened is it's backfired. Why? Because you're building without any solid foundation. You're trying to build on top of, you know, the ground, but you have no foundation. You know, when you build, when you, when you make a building, like, like the one we're in right now, you have to make foundation. 
If you don't build the foundation first, that building will not survive. And especially in places where there's earthquakes. Let me give you an example. Japan. There's earthquakes there, and so they build their, 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 their structures in such a way to be able to withstand the shaking of an earthquake. There's a specific type of foundation that they have to make so that if the earth shakes, it doesn't destroy the building. This is what we have to do psychologically and spiritually. We have to have a certain type of foundation so that what life hits us, what life throws at us, right? Sometimes we're going to be shaken in life, like an earthquake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثُلُ الَّذِينَ قَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Do you think that you will enter paradise without going through that which those who came before you went through? They went through calamity, adversity, struggle, and they were shaken. Zulzilu, the word zulzilu in, in, in Arabic is from the same root as the word zilzal in Arabic, which means earthquake. So they're shaken like an earthquake. That, they were shaken so much in their lives, and they were tested. Now watch this. They're so shaken like an earthquake until even the messengers and those with the messengers asked, When will the help of Allah come? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala inna nasrullahi qareeb. Indeed, the help of Allah is near. The help of Allah isn't just there, isn't just existing, it's near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't just there, he doesn't just exist, he is near. Allah says that, we, that he is closer to us than our jugular vein. So realize that Allah is near. Allah is not just there, he's near. But we're going to be shaken sometimes. And so how does a, a building withstand an earthquake? And the answer all goes back to the type of foundation. That is istiqama. What type of foundation do you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So that when you are tested, and you will be tested, and you will be tested with various things, when you are tested, are you able to withstand that test? So Aisha radiallahu anha is saying, that the first verses didn't say give up alcohol, give up fornication, zina, because people would have said we'll never give up these things if it started with that. Why? Because they had not yet built a foundation. They had not yet built the roots of the tree. They were not, there was no roots yet. So if you come to a person from the very beginning and you give them rules, they're not going to follow the rules if it goes against what they want, if they have no foundation. And that's the mistake many of us are making. So going back to the example of how many of us are being raised and how we're raising our children. We're not building a foundation, but we're throwing rules. We're not talking about building an attachment to Allah, love of Allah. What does it really mean to put our reliance on Allah? Where is that being taught to children? The only thing being taught to children is it's haram to eat this, it's haram to drink this, it's haram to dress like this, it's haram to say this, it's haram to do this. That's it. And the problem with that method is it's being rejected. Just as Aisha radhiallahu anha said. Isn't that what she's saying? She said if you start off with the rules, if Allah had started off with the rules, even with the companions, they would have rejected the rules. But it did not start off with the rules. Allah did not start with the rules. If you study, give you an example, Juz Amma. Juz Amma is, almost, is basically Meccan. It's basically Meccan verses. And if you look at Juz Amma, is it about rules? Is there fiqh in Juz Amma? Not really. 
all of Juz Amma is about the Day of Judgment, about Allah, human beings' relationship with Allah, human psychology, taqwa, retribution, jannah, jahannam, you know, how we treat one another. That's what's in Juz Amma. Because that was the foundation building. If you want istiqama, you have to build a foundation in the love of Allah. You have to build a foundation in the, the, the proper taqwa and in the tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to have trust. You have to build a foundation of trust and reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I want to take a moment and go back to a point that I was making about why this is being rejected, the way in which we are using shame and fear. Now you hear fear and you say, but isn't that a good thing? Isn't that taqwa? What's wrong with fear? I'm going to tell you there is healthy fear and there is unhealthy fear. Okay? There is healthy fear and there's unhealthy fear. Let me give you an example. You know when you do something really, really bad, and you're really scared of your parents? Anyone? Okay. And if you're really, really scared, sometimes what do you do? Do you run to the parents or do you run away from the parents? You, you run away and hide, right? So there's basically two ways to respond when you hurt someone or you make a mistake. Imagine that you hurt your close friend or a spouse. You know, there's some people who feel so bad about it, so shameful, they feel ashamed that what do they do? They hide. They try to avoid the person. They try to hide from the issue. They, they distance themselves from the person. Right? Is that a healthy way to deal with it? Does that solve the problem or does it make it worse? Anyone? It makes it worse. This is what some of us do with Allah. That when we feel like we've made a mistake, when we feel ashamed, so instead of going to Allah, we run away from Allah. We try to hide from Allah. We don't want to go pray because we feel ashamed. Or we, wanna, we don't want to talk about Allah, or, or maybe we want to leave religion completely because we feel ashamed. But what's a healthier way to deal with that? When you've hurt someone, what's the healthiest way to fix it? To go to the person and to apologize. To go to the person and say, I'm sorry, I regret it, I admit, and I'm going to try to do better. That is istighfar and tawbah. That's what we're supposed to do. That's healthy fear. That's a healthy response when you make a mistake. Is that instead of trying to hide from Allah, I want nothing to do with, with religion. I want nothing to do with God. Oh, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to pray because I've committed so many sins. I feel too ashamed to face Allah. That's an unhealthy type of shame. But the healthy fear is called taqwa. The healthy fear is called taqwa. And taqwa will make you try to stay away from what angers Allah. And if you do what angers Allah, you rush to apologize. You rush to repent. To, 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 to show your regret and to try to make it better. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because I think that what's happening is we are feeding the wrong kind of fear and shame. Because when you teach about Allah like a scary policeman, a'udhu billah, you're encouraging your children to actually avoid Allah, not run to Allah and apologize. Not run to Allah and be closer to Allah. We're, av we're actually encouraging people to try to avoid Allah and religion completely and the deen. So healthy fear will motivate us to get closer to Allah and repent. Unhealthy shame will make us run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoid him. Out of shame. 
So in order for us to have this ability to be firm in our deen, to have istiqamah, we have to have healthy fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called taqwa. Healthy fear is taqwa. Now, how do we build healthy fear? You know what the, you know, you know what the seed of healthy taqwa is? This is interesting. Let me put it this way. Let me back up. There is a seed to unhealthy shame. You know, a seed grows into a tree, right? But it all starts at the seed level, right? So if you want to address something, go look at the root and then find the seed. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the seed of unhealthy shame, you know what it is? It's thinking that you're supposed to be perfect. That's actually counterintuitive. Like, it's deep. It's the myth of perfection. It's when you are taught or you believe that you're actually supposed to be perfect. If you believe that, then you will, you will react with unhealthy shame when you make a mistake. Why? Because you feel like I was supposed to be perfect and I'm not perfect and I am so ashamed of myself, I'm not even going to try anymore. It leads you into despair. But what was the root cause? What's the seed of it that you thought you were supposed to be perfect? Or maybe that's what you were taught. Maybe that's what you were taught by your, by your, by your family, by your culture. Now let's go to the root or the seed of healthy taqwa and and healthy istighfar, repentance, and healthy tawbah, going back to Allah. Do you know what the root is? Do you know what the seed is? Knowing that all human beings will make mistakes. It's the opposite. It's realizing that the human being is imperfect. And that's the creation of Allah. When you know that, then you will respond with repentance because you know, you know, I'm human, I've messed up again. I'm going to I'm going to try to fix it. I'm going to try to I'm going to try again. I'm going to repent. The Prophet ﷺ said that all the children of Adam will make mistakes. And who are the best of them? Those who repent. We have to let go of the myth of perfection because it is the root cause of so many of our problems. It is the reason why we actually fall into despair. Because if you're told you're supposed to be perfect and you end up realizing that you're not perfect because you're human and you will never be perfect because it's not the design. How can you go against the, the, the divine design? Tell me. How can anyone go against the divine design? Allah said that he created human beings imperfect. So how can you go against that? Think about it. It's impossible. This is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you try to go against that, you will end up hitting with despair. Allah tells us, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِ أَلَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O my servant, who have wronged your own selves, when we commit sin, we aren't hurting Allah, we're hurting ourselves. We don't, we don't wrong Allah. We don't take away from Allah. Allah's kingdom is, is infinite. He's rich. But we hurt ourselves. You know, it's like if you drink poison, are you hurting yourself or the doctor? If you refuse to take your medicine, are you hurting yourself or the doctor? Yourself, right? If you, if you decide to stop breathing, it's you who's, who's getting hurt, not the doctor. So realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't the one 
who we're wronging, it's ourselves that we're wronging when we sin. So Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي O oh my slave, who have wronged, who have transgressed against their own selves. لا تقنط من رحمة الله Don't despair of the mercy of Allah. Allah is telling us not to despair, but many of us, we despair because we have the wrong concept of ourselves and the wrong concept of Allah. When we think of ourselves, we think I'm supposed to be perfect. I better be perfect. And if I'm not perfect, then I'm worthless. You, you, know, you know what all or none is? Yeah? You're either, you either have to be an angel, otherwise you're a devil. Right? It's, this, it's black and white. We have to stop that. Benny Adam is not one or the other. Benny Adam is not an angel. And Benny Adam, hopefully, is not a devil. A believer, a believer is someone who is flawed, but continues to repent and to try hard to, to get it right. Who gets back up after they fall. So the Prophet ﷺ said that all the children of Adam will make mistakes, but the best are those who repent. Letting go of this false sense of perfection will allow us the ability to get back up when we fall. And you want to hear something else that's really counterintuitive? Shaitan feeds off of this false sense of perfection. He uses it as a weapon against us. Can I tell you how? When you make a mistake, or I make a mistake, he will come to us and he'll say, look at you, how shameful is you? You're going to go pray now after you did this? When you're such a terrible person, you're just a hypocrite. Look at you. How shameful is you? You're going to keep wearing your hijab while you're such a bad person? You should just take it off and stop being a hypocrite. Does any of this sound familiar? This is how shaitan uses this tool of false perfection. If a person knew that they are not perfect and they were never created to be perfect, then when shaitan comes at you that way, you say, yes, I know I made a mistake, but Allah is the most merciful. That's what Allah wants us to have is hope in his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if someone goes to Allah with sins that, that, go, that fill the area between the heavens and the earth, do you know how much that is? Think about it. The area between the earth and the sky, filled with sins. Who has that many sins? I mean, that's a lot of sins. No one else is really excited about how many sins that is. She is, okay. She's like, I am. <laughs> that's a lot. And you know what Allah says? He says if, you, if, if anyone comes to him with sins filling the heavens and the earth, like the area between the heavens and the earth, and they sincerely repent, to Allah, Allah will give them forgiveness as big or more. See, that's who Allah is. Allah isn't a policeman who's waiting to throw you in jail. Allah is the most merciful. And the problem is that we're not teaching his mercy. We're just teaching his wrath. We're not teaching the attachment to Allah. We're just teaching rules. We're not talking about the roots. We're just fighting over the leaves. You know? Well, you have to put on, you know, the, the, the dress has to be like this. This is allowed. This is not allowed. Which ingredients in the halal food are really halal and which are like not really halal, but they're really halal? Like, I've actually seen a bottle of water that says halal certified on it. It was water. <laughs> like, it's halal, guys. <laughs> halal water. water. Um, this is like, this is 
missing the forest for the trees. This is missing the forest for a leaf on the trees. We aren't, we aren't focusing on the roots. And you know what I've seen happen? I've seen children raised as a hafiz, mashallah. They were raised in the madrasa. They were raised to recite Quran. They were raised to memorize Quran. But the moment that they're tested, they get knocked down. Why do you think that happens? And you know what I'm talking about. I think you know what I'm talking about. Why do you think that phenomenon happens? With someone who was raised with the shell, the shell, right? They dressed a certain way. Their parents dressed them a certain way. They were in the madrasa, alhamdulillah, very important. They learned the Qur'an. Maybe they memorized the entire Qur'an. But they didn't get deep. It was the shell. They put on the, the garments. They put on the clothes. They could recite it. But was it deep? And if it wasn't deep, the moment they're tested, they fall over. And sometimes that's a phenomenon we don't understand. How could this happen? But he was a hafid, she was a hafid. How could this happen? You know why it happens? Because if the Qur'an is only on the tongue, if the taqwa is only in the dress, you're not going to have solid, deep roots. And the first wind that you face in your life, you're going to be swept away. And it's not going to be enough that you wore the outer, you know, the outer, the outer costume. The costume won't be enough. And I don't belittle the importance of the outer worship, by the way, because it is part of our deen. The outer worship and the inner worship. I began with that. It's both. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ It has to be both. Those who believe and do righteous deeds. You cannot do one and not the other. But the problem is many of us are focusing only on the outer. And if you focus only on the outer, it's like growing a tree or building a, a structure and you don't have foundation and you don't have roots. When wind comes, it knocks it down. When an earthquake comes, it knocks down that building. We have to have solid roots. So how do we build those solid roots practically? First, I told you, we have to remove the myth of human perfection. We have to set a different understanding that the human being wasn't created to be perfect. The human being was created to keep repenting and keep trying again. Can you imagine if a child learning to walk, the first time the child falls, just stops trying to walk? just sits there, and that's the end of walking, right? The person will never walk. Can you imagine a person driving, and the moment they make a wrong turn, they just turn off the car and park it, and they stop driving? I'm done. That's it. I made a wrong turn. Imagine the GPS says, you made a wrong turn. Just stop trying. Turn off the car. Your trip is over. Stop trying to get to your destination. You made a wrong turn. Turn off the car. Right? The GPS says something different. What does the GPS say? Recal recalculating. Rerouting. What is that? That's Toba. That's actually Toba. Literally, it's Toba. Why? Because Toba means to return. So it's when the GPS is telling you you made a wrong turn, so turn around. I'm going to reroute you. That's the process of istighfar and tawbah. And tawbah in the Arabic language literally means to turn around and return. We have to be able to do this. If we stop the car every time we make a wrong turn, we won't get anywhere. If we stop trying to walk every time we fell when we were children, we would never walk. So we have to be able to get back up, to repent, and to keep going and try again. That's the first thing for istiqamah. You know, if you told yourself, I'm never going to leave the house unless there's perfect weather, 
There can't be any haze. There can't be any rain. And there can't be any humidity. I'm in Malaysia, so basically you will never leave your house. Right? You have to have the ability to keep going even when conditions aren't perfect. Right? How can you have that? How can you build that? I'll tell you what you have to do to build that, inshallah. We have to take care of our hearts. And we have to do the internal ibadah and the external ibadah. I'll tell you just a prescription quickly of how to do that. Three parts to this prescription. The first is your salah. Salah is like oxygen of the heart. It's the first thing you'll, at, you'll be asked about on the Day of Judgment. And it's keeping you alive spiritually and psychologically. And mentally. Number two, I advise you to download an app called My Dua. It's spelled M-Y-D-U-A-A. And this is Fortress of a Muslim in, in an app. I advise you to do your morning supplications, your evening supplications, and the supplications before you sleep. It doesn't have to be all or none. You don't have to do every single one, but pick a collection that you can do regularly. Consistency is key. Consistency is key, even if it's small, even if it's a tiny amount, but be consistent and you will see results. Number three is the Quran, the words of Allah. The book of Allah, you have to stay connected to it daily. And don't just read it, but understand what you're reading. And apply it in your life. Be connected to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. I told you three things. These things will keep you solid. Will help you build solid roots. So that when life sends earthquakes and life sends rain and life sends wind, it doesn't destroy you. But it's very, very important that we are consistent. And make sure that you're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're building a relationship with Allah. When you read your azkar, understand what you're saying. When you're reading Quran, understand what Allah is saying. When you're saying your salah, understand what you're saying. Even if Arabic is not your first language, learn what you're saying in the salah. You can do that. Anyone can do that. Learn the parts of the salah. Why am I saying subhana rabbi al-a'la? And why am I saying uh, semi Allah liman hamida? Why when I put my head to the lowest, I am praising Allah the highest? Right? Learn why you're saying these things and that's how you'll build a, a stronger foundation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, I want to just highlight one part. These three steps will keep your heart alive. Will build that solid foundation. The roots. But we don't only want to keep our heart alive. We also have to keep our heart clean. And we also have to keep our heart protected. So I want you guys to think about the heart like you think about the body, all right? In order to have a healthy life, you have to have a body that is fed, a body that has oxygen, a body that has healthy food, right? Water. But what if you're eating healthy, you're breathing, but... You don't ever take a shower. What if you're the, you know, you say, you know what, I don't need to take a shower because I did that last Ramadan. It's okay. I'm fine. Well, you're not going to be fine and no one's going to want to sit next to you. Um, and you're going to probably get very sick. Why? Because you have to keep cleaning the body. It's not enough to feed the body. It's not enough to breathe, but you have to maintain the cleanliness of the body, right? The heart is the same way. The heart has to be cleaned. How do we clean the heart, you think? Repentance. Istighfar. So part of our daily afkar needs to be istighfar. Needs to be repentance. Think of that as like the shower. 
for the heart. And then finally, imagine that you're breathing fine, you're eating fine, you're taking a shower, but after you take a shower, you go and roll around in the, in the dirt. You know, like a, like a kid, you, you got to get them all clean. You know, you put pretty bows on her hair and pretty dress. And then right after that, she goes and she plays in the mud. What's going to happen? You're going to get dirty again, right? So part of the process of taking care of the heart is not just oxygen, food, and cleaning, but protection. It's guarding the heart. How do we guard the heart? Well, here's how we guard the heart. Through the openings to the heart. What are the openings to the heart? The eyes, the ears, the tongue. The eyes, the ears, and the tongue. Those are the openings to the heart. Think of the heart like your sanctuary, like your home. Do you keep your windows and doors open at night or do you close them? You close them, you lock them, and maybe you have a security system and a fence. And depending where you are in the world, there are some places in the world everyone has an electric fence, like South Africa. So what is that? That's for protection, right? So your heart, think of your heart like your sanctuary, your home. You have to guard it. You have to protect it. You have to keep the doors closed. When you are not guarding your eyes, when you're not conscious of what you're looking at, it's like leaving your doors open at night. And now the robber comes in and he steals everything and he destroys your home. Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Yours, because you left the door open. This is what we're doing, by the way, right now. Is we have completely abandoned the idea, the concept of ghadd al-basar, of lowering and guarding the eyes. And especially with now the social media culture. We have become so lax. We don't even think twice about what we're looking at. And I'm talking the whole spectrum, all the way from checking someone out on their profile pictures to their Instagram photos, all the way to pornography. And there's a big spectrum in between, but we're not guarding our eyes. And when you're looking at someone of the opposite gender or you're looking at something that you're not supposed to be looking at, you are pouring poison into your own heart. That is not protecting the heart. That is poisoning the heart. It's putting black spots on the heart. And then it puts black spots on the rest of your life. It will affect your relationships. If you're looking at the opposite gender, as you shouldn't be looking, guess what's happening there in the unseen? I'll tell you what's happening in the unseen. Shaitan works with that glance and then beautifies what you're looking at in a way that it doesn't actually look, all right? So shaitan will deceive you to make you believe that what you're looking at is more beautiful than it is or more attractive than it is. So now all of a sudden, this thing that isn't halal for you looks better than what is halal for you. You understanding what I'm saying? So now this thing that is not halal for you that you're looking at and you weren't supposed to be looking at looks more attractive than your spouse. That's how shaitan works. But why did that happen? Because you weren't guarding your eyes. And so you opened yourself up to that. And so it puts this black spot not only in your heart, but in your relationships. You lose the barakah. You lose the blessing. You lose the protection. And it's all about the eyes. And like I said, this goes from all the way from looking at maybe someone who's completely wearing hijab, everything, but you're staring at them. Maybe you're staring at their, their photos online. You're not supposed to be doing that. That's not guarding the eyes. That's not ghadd al-basar. Ghadd al-basar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded it in the Qur'an to men individually and then to women individually. That's how important it was. So guarding your eyes. And I said that's, the, the, that's one side of the spectrum and all the way to pornography and everything in between. What we're seeing on the screens, what we're seeing on billboards, what we're seeing on our phone, what we're seeing on our tablets, what we're seeing on our social media, what we're seeing on the internet. Have we stopped guarding our eyes? 
that is one of the biggest openings to poison that's going into our hearts. And it's one of the sources of poison um, uh, for the heart. The ears, what you're listening to, also goes directly to the heart. What you use your tongue for, what are you talking about? What are you talking about all the time also goes into your heart. And so we have to guard the openings to the heart in order to have istiqama. Akhulin qawli hadha wa astaghfar Allah li wa lakum inna ghafurun rahim subhanaka Allah wa bihamdak ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruk wa atubu laik jazakum Allahu khairan I think we are going to take a um, brief uh, break and I would like to just um, announce that uh, there are a few limited copies of um, these books, Reclaim Your Heart, Love and Happiness. I Lost My Way and Shattered Glass are both transcriptions of seminars that I gave. Um, I Lost My Way is about finding happiness after despair and um, Shattered Glass is about healing a broken heart. It's about uh, emotional resilience. Uh, and so if you'd like to get a copy, um, inshallah, we, it's available here. Um, but keep in mind there are limited copies, so inshallah get yours. Um, Love and Happiness uh, is a collection of uh, quotes and insights. And uh, Reclaim Your Heart is um, work that I did over like a decade um, about how to live in this life without being owned by dunya uh, and dealing with relationships, learning to love in the right way, uh, learning to have... Um, a balanced life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the creation. So uh, inshallah, those are available. Also one other announcement, um, for those of you who are looking for any type of um, co counseling, one of the things that we're finding in our communities right now is a lot of people have problems and they don't want to reach out for help because sometimes there's a stigma, they feel like ashamed to ask for help, uh, whether that problem is in your marriage or you know a, a mental health issue or whatever struggle it is. Um, so I want to just let you know if you are uh, looking for any kind of help, if you're having a situation where uh, you need uh, counseling uh, for marriage, um, or if you know any brothers, one of the issues too is a lot of men, uh, they, they, they're, they're suffering, but they don't want to ask for help. Um, if you know anyone uh, who, who may be looking um, inshallah, we can give you the reference. My husband does uh, Islamic-based coaching. So he does this for couples and he does it for men's issues. Uh, he, he deals with all types of issues from addiction to infidelity to problems within the marriage and does it from an Islamic perspective. So if you are interested, inshallah, we um, will have contact details available. Um, and inshallah, if you know someone, then inshallah, refer them. Because there's no shame in seeking help. This is part of our deen um, and part of our worship to try to do our best while putting our trust in Allah. So, um, Jazakum Allah khairan. Um, inshallah, I will also be signing uh, at the end. Um, so, inshallah, use this break to get your copies. I guess that will make the end um, more smooth, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.